HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by Roberta's, home of Heritage Radio Network for 10 years. Learn more about Roberta's at robertaspizza.com. Hello, welcome to Japan Eats. I'm your host, Aki Kotema, a food writer and the director of the New York Japanese Culinary Academy, which promotes a deep understanding of Japanese cuisine in America. This show is all about Japanese food and food culture. We see, see, see sushi at every day on the supermarket, but what is beyond sushi? We hear dashi ramen and zakaya, but what exactly are they? Japanese food is so mystery for many people, so I'll try to demystify it in this program with my cool guests. And my guest today is Andrea Tatsari, who is a, who is a Tokyo-based photographer in travel, portraiture, and the culinary world. Andrea joined me on episode 113 to discuss her then new book, Tokyo New Rape, 13 Chefs Defining Japan's Next Generation with Recipes, uh, which won the 2019 James Beard Foundation Book Awards. And Andrea just published a fascinating new book called Sushi Shokunin, Japan's Culinary Masters from uh, Oslin. And Shokunin means craftsman or artisan. And you cannot talk about Japanese cuisine without understanding the craftsmanship running through it. And Andrea beautifully and insightfully captures the idea of Japanese shokunin in her new book. And you can tell her profound understanding of Japanese culture, as well as love and passion for it. So today we'll discuss the uniqueness of Japanese-style craftsmanship, how sushi masters practice it, the concept of ikigai, which is the backbone of their professional life, how the traditional sushi industry is changing, and much, much more. But before we start, Japan is available on Heritage Radio Network website, as well as on iTunes, Stitcher, and now on Spotify, Spotify as a podcast. So please go to iTunes, Stitcher, and Spotify, and subscribe to Japan Eats. And please write a review. We really appreciate your feedback. Also, if you have any ideas about the topics, topics of the show or show guests, please let us know. You can email us at japaneats at the Heritage Radio Network to org, or akikokatema.com. Now let's start our conversation with Andrea Vasari. Hello, Andrea. Welcome back. Hello there. Thank you so much for having me again. So it's good so, to hear your voice. Oh, it's very exciting to see your book. So <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So the first book, of course, was very impressive and very thorough. And mm-hmm. it's, uh, of course, you won the James Beard Awards book awards. Yes, I, I did. I, I, I won it for my photography for that book. Yes. Mm, congratulations thank you so uh so first of all for listeners who have not listened to episode 113 uh, could you tell us your background oh sure um i am originally from uh, manhattan i as you explained already i am a uh, photographer i'm an author i'm also something i call a chef whisperer (laughs) <laughs> and I'm, I'm a designer in the sense that I also work heavily on the presentation aspect of my books. Uh, and I'd say I'm a storyteller. I tell mostly culinary stories of food, always in a cultural context, uh, because I very much believe that once you talk about food, you learn so much about any culture. You learn about the politics, the agriculture, the art, the design, really endless topics once you delve into the culinary world. Um, right. And I've lived in seven countries, including Japan, and I moved to Tokyo in 2015. 
I had vowed that I would do so about 20 years ago when I first visited, uh, because I was I was essentially enthralled by everything on that first trip. So I vowed to live there, and I finally made it happen. Mm. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, and also you, you extensively traveled over yes. a tremendous number of countries, right? Yes, yes, um, just about 90 um, wow. <laughs> I began as a travel photographer, and I still am, uh, but now, in addition to my photography, uh, being an author is extremely important to me, and my writing is also quite important to me, um, mm. but of course, yes, the visual aspect is my first love. <laughs> right, yeah, so, um, well, your book, we're going to just talk about, but you are mm. kind of a way to see that various unique Japanese culture Mm-hmm. I think it's based on your extensive knowledge of how things work globally, universally. So, yes, and also the, the my my very profound appreciation of Japanese aesthetics is something that's very appealing to me um, innately, in a way, because I'm always drawn to the aesthetics, not only through my photography, but in design and the art world as well. And actually, before I became a photographer, I, I worked in the fashion world. Um, I was I worked for Armani and Dolce Gabbana, for example. And I also worked in, in film. I did public relations for Miramax Films. And so I think this all comes together in how I see things and how I communicate um, about Japan in these two books. Mm, right. I think Japan is lucky to have you. To have oh, somebody you're very <laughs> kind, but I'm lucky, uh, you know, to be experiencing Japanese culture firsthand. I mean, to me, um, it's 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 my home. I feel so comfortable. Um, there are, of course, many things I don't understand and, and never can. Um, however, I think that I have grown to understand quite a bit, and it's it's a place that really touches me. So. Mm. Um, I think it's in a, a very, very special place. Right. Okay, so let's dive into your new book, uh, Sushi Shokunin, Japan's mm-hmm. Culinary Masters, yeah. uh, which just came out at the end of September. Yes, uh, after a five-month yeah. delay. <laughs> <laughs> so wow. I'm so excited for it to finally come out. <laughs> wow. <Yes. laughs> So, okay, so it's full of stunningly beautiful photos of sushi masters and the mm. restaurants and sushi that looks like uh, precious jewelry yes. and all taken by yourself. And yes. uh, what each photo releases, to me, it's lively and refreshing. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's really interesting to see these focused, very hardworking and proud human beings like they mm-hmm. are. So, yes. yeah, so first of all, why did you decide to create a book about sushi masters? Well, I have to say that the traditional uh, Edo cuisines, and Edo is the original term for Tokyo, um, that would be tempura, soba, sushi, um, things like this, are very um, enticing to me because they convey so much about the history of the country, the traditions inherent in the country, and they reflect a lot of, of really singular ideas about Japanese culture. Mm. So I noticed that when I moved to Tokyo, finally, I just walking around, you know, doing errands or what have you any given day, I was most drawn consistently to the facades of the sushi, which are the sushi restaurants for their simplicity, their purity. um, And I couldn't eat, though. I couldn't eat in them because I was still concerned. As I explained in my introduction, I'll just explain briefly. I, many years prior, I had had a very serious tropical illness. So I wasn't allowed to eat sushi, among other foods, for many, many, many years. And upon returning to live in, um, actually, upon moving to Japan, I still hadn't eaten sushi in many, many years. It was getting Ah. harder to resist because it's, it's, (laughs) You know, it's everywhere. Um, different types of sushi, different levels of sushi are everywhere. And so noticing these facades, so the, the architectural elements, the design elements really got me thinking, could I try it? Am I ready? How do I feel about it? But I noticed I was still a bit nervous at the prospect 
of trying sushi again, just because I'd been um, sick for quite a while. Um, so finally, I made my way back, which I explained uh, in more detail in the introduction. Um, I made my way back to a sushi meal. Uh, and it was at uh, Sugita, the full name of his restaurant is actually Nihonbashi Kakigeracho Sugita. Um, but Takaki Sugita is the shokunin. And the experience I had was incredibly touching. Um, I became emotional uh, during the meal. And it was basically then that I decided that I must do a project about sushi to wow. understand it more to learn more about the shokunin above all mm. and to understand it in a more profound way because it touched me so. And that's the, that's the basic reason for the book. Right. Okay. Mm. Uh, how many years ago was it? Well, I moved to Tokyo five years uh, in 2015, but my first trip to Japan was in 20, uh, 2000, the year 2000. Right. Okay. But my meal with Sugita was soon about a year after I'd been living in, in Tokyo. Oh, wow. So it's a long project you really incubated and made it yes. happen. Yes, <laughs> yes. But it was definitely the strong, visceral experience, which I it was unexpected. I didn't expect to react this way. Mm. And, right. I, and I did. So it changed my path creatively. Right. Um so are we going to discuss the Chef Sugita, the, uh, you know, the restaurant, because that's mm -hmm. the, sorry, Takagi um, Sugita. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but, you know, to, just to back up, the Edo period existed from 17th century, and that was when, you know, Tokyo used to be, they really started fun culture. Yes. And people say New Yorkers are similar to Edo citizens because they are really quick and... Uh, yes, yes, they yeah. want to eat quickly. Yes, I, mm -hmm. sushi so, was a fast food. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, so we were talking about sushi today. It's a Edomai style sushi, yes. which is a piece of fish topped on, um, you know, like a bowl, little bowl, bowl it's, of rice. Yes, That's, it's mostly defined. It's, it's defined by many characteristics, but mostly the nigiri, which most people know in the West, and mm -hmm. also different methods of treating the fish, like curing, salting, drying, smoking, which extended right. the fish shelf life. Mm -hmm. Right. And also really maximize the umami. Exactly. Flavor. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then it's, it's so simple. It's just a piece of fish on top of a bowl of rice. But if you try to make sushi by yourself, it's, I, I was miserable. Yes. No, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't work. It, it's never the same at all. That's right. why I think the simple, the simple foods, when they're really powerful and super delicious are the ones that are the most difficult to create all the time. Mm. Uh, the ones with fewer ingredients, uh, these are always the most challenging and they take the skill of these shokunin to really um, put them across in a way that, that, that is truly stunning uh, in your mouth, but also um, as an experience, because for me, sushi or dining in general, eating in general is never just about the food. Mm. Um, it's about the atmosphere. It's about the service. You know, omotenashi in Japan, Japanese hospitality is mm. something very unique also to me in the world, which I um, adore and appreciate tremendously. Um, right. So all of these things come together and um, create an experience which is really unsurpassable. Mm. And you mentioned, you know, the facade of sushi place, and it's very distinctive, not just how yes. it looks, but mm -hmm. how it smells, like the cleanest. Oh, absolutely. In fact, in Tokyo New Wave, it's funny you say that in my in previous book, I talked about some of my first memories from that trip in 2000, where I would walk about the city and in other parts of Japan and smell, you know, the soy that cooked, you know, I'm not just talking about sushi restaurants, but those those um, uh, fragrances and aromas, like uh, the katsuoboshi, all the different smells that kind of waft about on the sidewalk when you're walking. And that's definitely something uh, which influenced me as well with um, the sushi ya when I moved there five years ago. Mm. Mm. 
Right. And I, I know uh, sushi chefs, um, also, for example, I happened to be in one sushi place uh, late at night, and they completely washed, literally washed the whole restaurant. They absolutely. Walked. It's a ritual <laughs> every night. Absolutely. It's, it's right. definitely a ritual. It's part of the process, and cleanliness is extremely important. Cleanliness is next to godliness or close to godliness what is the exact saying in in english i forget um Mm. but it's the two are equivalent uh cleanliness is extremely important to a shokunin right so it's not just for our health department it's for themselves like a mind cleaning kind of absolutely yes because also in sushi nothing is hidden uh basically it's an they're dealing with honesty in regard to their customers, like the customer, you're sitting at the counter, you're watching the shokunin, everything is prepared in front of you, with the exception of some preparation that might go, you know, the the curing, the salting, things like that will have happened in the kitchen. But the actual preparation of what you're going to eat in that moment happens in front of you. And it's made with their hands. It's very uh, pure. It's very honest. They can't hide anything there are not a lot of ingredients and so it all um, sort of ties together the idea of cleanliness and purity and honesty and reverence for the customer it's very aspirational you know Mm. sushi to me is about sort of existing on another plane really a spiritual plane Mm. Um, and I feel this especially when when I eat the sushi, which I talk about in this book. Right. Mm. Okay. So I think first we should uh, understand the term shokunin. Yes. It's very so important. what is shokunin? Well, I'd like to read just an excerpt from my introduction, if that's okay, to explain to the audience um, yes, please. what a shokunin is. Because I, I considered for some time how to best explain it in a short, in, in a relatively short, uh, concise way. Um, There is no single English word that adequately conveys the meaning of shokunin. While it is typically translated as craftsman or artisan, these definitions fail to express the magnitude and breadth of the Japanese term. Inherent in a more exacting translation, master craftsman is a glimmer of the more expansive nature of true shokunin. Concurrently, they are altruistic leaders teachers and artists of tremendous spirit and skill who strive for excellence, not only for themselves, but also for the benefit of others, their families, apprentices, customers, communities, and regions. This dedication to a lifelong pursuit of the highest level of mastery, spurred by an unwavering desire to constantly improve, affords all types of shokunin a respected and integral role in Japanese society where the fruits of their discipline and talent have been enjoyed for centuries. They are particularly noteworthy, Susi Shokunin specifically, are noteworthy examples of this way of being. Through the daily preparation of sushi, these master craftsmen express their individual identities and their passionate reverence for Japan's singular bountiful terroir. Wisdom and tradition passed down from the generations of Shokunin who have preceded them have instilled in these men an unwavering faith in repetition and ritual, a rigorous attention to detail, and an often palpable sense of gratitude. Particularly poignant is the shokunin's humble devotion to pure, wholehearted emotenashi, which I would just refer to Japanese hospitality, unmatched anywhere in the world. Mm. Right. Um, There's a lot. And uh, it's it's beyond just... uh, vocation it's Mm -hmm. a lifestyle yes it's a belief system it's a lifestyle absolutely it's kind of all-encompassing um which is also why many of the shokunin told me that without sushi they have nothing Mm. their lives would be non-existent without sushi right when you said you know in your introduction the word repetition right so it's Mm -hmm. like you know making the same thing over and over it's like almost uh you know, judo or kendo or kind mm-hmm. of martial arts kind yes, of mindset? Yes, By, I mean, by repeating. I, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. because it's in the repetition that you 
reach for that level of excellence or perceived perfection. And it's the reaching, it's not the arrival, because of course, perfection is always elusive. Mm. They're never going to reach that level. But that as aspiration to that level is what fills their days and gives them purpose. Mm. Um, and I think that if we talk about shokunin in another discipline, for example, uh, there are very specific artisans, specific shokunin, who are tremendously skilled in a particular way of painting the top coat of lacquerware, for example. I mean, they can be that specific, where that's all that they do. Um, and if you think of someone who every day is going into his studio or her studio um, just to paint lacquerware with a specific technique, that has been honed over usually many, 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 many years. That is that is a stunning degree of dedication. So these sushi shokunin are doing that too, but they're doing it with fish and they're preparing food for us. They're mm. giving us an experience, um, you know, and it's a give and take because we're consuming the food. Uh, it, it's it's different, of course, than someone in a studio making. Um, painting lacquerware but it just is a way to understand the dedication to craft and making something right. um, which becomes very spiritual because it's that daily desire to to constantly improve which I included in the introduction as well that that's a key element to a shokunin mm, interesting because I think uh, Japanese society I think mean, all the industries or kind of mindset Mm -hmm. is based on specialization meaning mm -hmm. if you specialize yes. in this one you are in charge and you yes. have someone else to work together mm -hmm. so it's yes. like right like fisherman um is a uh, always a team a part of the team of yes. chef. that kind of mindset it's mm -hmm. you are in charge you do the best yes and that's your mission of life that's absolutely and because you want to do good by others and not just the people who are in front of you, but the people who have preceded you in life, uh, people who will come after you're long gone in the future, you want to do your best um, because that inherently is something that is taught in Japan, even to, I believe in children, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, pride in work and doing one's best. I mean, this is a bit of a tangent, but in school in Japan, young children, are very much taught how to treat others and they're taught to take pride in cleaning the classroom and making lunch for others. Um, it's not adults who serve the children, it's children who serve other children. And I think already at a very young age, um, many children learn um, sort of the, the grace that can be found in serving others, but also in being clean, in, in helping others, in creating an atmosphere or even a thing that brings pleasure to others. So right. that altruistic notion is, is very much instilled um, at a young age. Now, whether or not they grow up into adults who continue on that path, I mean, obviously not everybody in Japan is that way, um, but they're exposed to that mentality very early on. Right, right. Like if you um, ride a subway, and on the platform, you know, people who are working uh, with the subway system, they're mm -hmm. so professional. Yes. Like even the sign is, okay, it's safe. Mm -hmm. They're amazing. I feel, yes. I just look yeah. at them. Right. right. And this is also part of the reason why, you know, public life functions extremely well uh, in Japan because people also respect rules. They respect the notion of public life in the sense that they don't want to cause trouble for other people. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of harmony in public life uh, with the, the way that, like, for example, the way Tokyo functions. Um, and I, I have a lot of appreciation for that as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So, uh, so what is the theme of the book? Well, the theme is absolutely the, the shokunin themselves, their artistry, what makes them tick really? Because I spent 
quite a quite a bit of time with each of them in private settings. You know, not during service, obviously. So I I really got to know them in a way that diners would not. Uh, this to me reveals even more about Japan itself, Japanese culture, uh, in a lot of depth, a lot of depth, and many other areas of Japanese culture that are not even specifically culinary, as I mentioned uh, when we first began this conversation. Um, so these men really taught me about themselves. They revealed to me their very humanity, which to me is extremely compelling because you can empathize with them. You can essentially become in, how do you say, endeared to them. Like they become these figures that are extremely uh, comfortable to be around, almost like uh, some sort of good friend because they have revealed their worries, their hopes, their fears, their, their, their things that they love, the things that happened to them as children. Uh, so having these interactions with these men who are usually somewhat sequestered like usually they're they're thought of as hidden figures or very private uh, or very formal or very stern. I didn't have that experience. Mm. I had a different kind of experience where they were so much, they were very approachable. Mm. Uh, they were very candid. Um, I was allowed into their lives essentially. And this is what I'm putting forward in this book a glimpse into people who are usually not this accessible and in right. turn learning about them, their personalities, a bit of their personal history. I'm also explaining to people more about Japan because to this day, so many people say to me, friends, mm -hmm. what have you, not in Japan, friends outside Japan, right. how could you live in Japan? It's so mysterious. It's, it's so cold. It's so difficult to understand. It's so, and my experience is, is not that. So I'm basically trying to say, no, it's like this. No, it's like this. So in this book, I'm basically saying, no, it's like this. Right. <laughs> I'm trying to just show that, that much more, uh, how do you say, you can identify with these men. Right. Um, it's interesting. So, so Japanese culture tend to be, yeah, like your friend said, it's uh, looking formal and colder, but they're mm -hmm. really waiting for the moment to open up and mm -hmm. get close to you. So that's, yes. I think, the beauty of the culture. Yes, it takes right? time, it takes trust, um, and they're every bit as emotional and uh, full of feeling as Italians or Spaniards. Um, it's just communicated in a different way right mm -hmm. okay so uh one of the key concepts i think we need to discuss this is uh you introduce in the book it's the word ikigai yeah. i-k-i-g-a-i -I -I, yeah. yeah. so what is it and uh, how do sushi masters represent it mm. well in a basic sense ikigai is one sense of purpose um that reason one has to get up in the morning that which basically provides the central source of drive in your life. Mm. So Ikigai is central to a shokunin's life uh, because it is that sense of purpose inherent in creating sushi for others, for the community, um, for, you know, enjoyment, uh, for nutrition, for all those things. Um, but they're also expressing their identity every day and that's extremely important as well mm. but 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 basically reduced in its simplest form it's that's your sense of purpose right that's the reason you wake up for every morning yes, excited yes, yes right yeah the word ikigai is becoming a keyword for i think mental wellness in mm. recent years in western countries too yeah um so yeah i think it's really interesting that mm -hmm. people I think as sushi chefs, um, almost that focused attitude towards mm -hmm. life keeps mm -hmm. them very um, kind of 
energetic mm-hmm. in quiet way, mm-hmm. which is inspiring. Well, they experts always point to a sense of purpose uh, when they study those adults who live the longest in the world, the centenarians, the people who live over a hundred years old, when they talk about what allows that to happen beyond genes that someone inherits, what is it? It's lifestyle, it's social connections, it's diet. And one of the other things is sense of purpose. Mm. When you have a meaning, a a kind of meaning to your life um, that fulfills you, you are healthier. You feel better mentally and physically. Mm. Um, So all shokunin have this sense of ikigai. And of course, because I'm specifically talking about sushi shokunin in this book, uh, they are definitely uh, people who all referred to it in some form when I spoke to them. Mm. So how did you choose that 20 sushi masters uh, from all over Japan? Yes, it, it, it was a bit of a challenge, um, but then it became easier. I started actually with a list of 30, um, and they were shokunin that I knew of. Um, not all personally, some personally, but many not. Uh, and I whittled down the list based on style, uh, personality, um, a couple of other criteria, but also I worked on the list with some of my shokunin friends um, and I was guided uh, so that I also had that element of approval, so to speak. I I didn't want to think uh, that I in any way am an expert at all because I'm not. Um, So to consult with um, the shokunin in the book and a couple of them in particular who I've become closest to. Um, I thought it was the smartest way to come up with a list that reflected Edomai Sushi in in a more complete way um, with different styles, different personalities, different ages. Uh, and that's basically how the list came to be. Um, mm, so it was but were they... Expensive. Right, but were they open to be written up in an English publication, like a big book? Yes, um, <laughs> by and large, they were. Um, a couple were reticent. Um, a few that I thought I might like to include, maybe three, um, were very, very, very traditional, and they were probably too anxious at the prospect, so they... Uh, respectfully declined, but it was not an not a big issue at all. Um, and I understood, um, you know, sometimes some of the older gentlemen um, are so traditional in the sense that they just want to focus on what they're doing um, and not necessarily expose what they're thinking and feeling. So I'm definitely respectful of that. Um, mm. That sounds very shocking. (laughs) Yes, but it was literally only two or three. Uh, And then by then I had already decided to reduce the number of shokunin to 20. So in a way, some of them did me a favor because it would have been hard to um, include everyone in the book, ultimately. Um, Mm. But yes, they were very open. you know, some more than others, you know, you'll, you can get that sense perhaps as you're reading. Uh, but by and large, I was really honored to be allowed to participate in their lives in this way. Great. All right. So let's take a quick break here. And when we come back, we'll talk about the sushi masters in the book. So please stay with us. This episode is brought to you by Roberta's, home of Heritage Radio Network for 10 years. Roberta's was founded in Bushwick in 2008 and has become one of the most iconic restaurants in the country. HRN made its home inside of Roberta's in 2009, and together they have become part of the DIY fabric of the neighborhood. Roberta's, the pizza restaurant, is open for lunch and dinner seven days a week and serves much more than just the famous wood-fired pizzas. 
Their team dreams up new salads, pastas, and sandwiches on the regular. Roberta's Tiki Bar is alive and well in the back garden, serving up frozen drinks in the summer and hot toddies in the winter. Stop by the bakery and takeout spot next door for fresh breads, sticky buns, and pizzas to go. And of course, there's the two Michelin-starred Blanca tucked away in the garden for truly daring diners. But Roberta's also extends beyond Bushwick, with multiple locations in New York City and now in Los Angeles. You can also find their frozen pies in grocery stores around the country. The spirit of Roberta's, like Heritage Radio Network, is everywhere. Here's to many more years of pizza-powered radio. Learn more about Roberta's at robertaspizza.com. Welcome back. You're listening to Japan Meets, broadcasting live from studio. Uh, it's not Arabios, my studio in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. <laughs> and I'm um, your host, Eki Katema, and my guest today is Andrea Fasari, who is a Tokyo-based photographer and the author of the Tokyo New Wave, 31 Chefs Defining Japan's Next Generation, which won the 2019 James Beard of Foundation Book Awards. And Andrea just published a fascinating new book called Sushi Shokunin, Japan's Carry Masters. So let's talk about the actual sushi masters in the book. So Mm -hmm. first of all, I really enjoyed reading about um, Takashi Saito of Sushi Saito's um, close, very close relationship with a fish wholesaler Uh, Mm -hmm. in the Toyosa fish market. So Mm -hmm. could you tell us about it? And by the way, the chef Saito has earned three Michelin stars for the last, I think, six years or something, very long time. Yes, Um, maybe even more than that. Um, but they recently took the stars away. Did you know? Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> they, they took them away, <clears throat> excuse me, only because he, it's virtually impossible for the public to get a reservation. Oh, yeah, I read about that. Right, right. Yes. Right. So that's the only reason. He still is excellent and super uh, impressive as ever. Um, but it's one of their rules, I believe. Uh, if right. the public can't get a reservation, then they <laughs> that can't was him. Have the yes, wow. um, but I don't think he flinched. I don't think these things. That's also very much a trait of the shokunin. Um, the stars are are not really what they're concerned with. Um, mm. So I think the public at large responds um, more to rankings. Um, right. So so anyway, yes, his relationship is an example of the interdependence uh, between the, the wholesalers, the fish wholesalers, and the shokunin um, to procure the finest uh, fish and seafood. And Saito's uh, wholesaler, which I do talk about in his chapter, is Yukitaka, Yukitaka Yamaguchi, who is very famous as the, the tuna broker. Um, there are others, of course. Um, he is extremely well known uh, with the shokunin and, and even many, I think, Japanese in general. Um, he is really incredible to watch. Um, if you are able to ever see him at Toyosu, uh, the way he handles the fish, the way um, his employees work, um, they are... Uh, intense, quick, impressive, and it's a very, very lively environment. Um, But their relationship is one that obviously was built over time so that they know how the other responds, acts, chooses, and deciphers the best product. Yamaguchi-san understands Saito-san and vice versa. So this is why Saito-san can also operate the way he does at the level he does. And this is true for many of the shokunin. Their their brokers, their fish brokers, are very important to them. And some of these relationships, for example, a relationship that um, Isao Amano has. Now, Amano-san is in, um, uh, in the south of Japan, on the island of Kyushu. Um, he has been working with someone even for 50 years. Um, So these relationships are extremely important and they're also a kind of friendship. Um, And I think that their relationship with 
the the wholesaler is, is totally integral to to their mm. success. Right. So this is another thing that we discussed earlier: the specialization. And I think this trust is also really embedded in the Japanese kind of professional shokuni relationships. So mm-hmm. you understand each other, you trust hundred percent, and mm-hmm. you kind of you have to be together to survive in the yes. business as well. Yes, yeah. yes. It's it's a ritual that's that's every morning. Um, you know, the Saito san goes to Toyosu, they they talk, they look, they point, they feel, they uh, taste, they uh, it's just a morning happening to assure that the finest uh, fish will be in front of the customer that day. Mm. And also, um, you know, like that kind of partnership, if you have that inspiring chef, um, you know, the wholesaler, the Toyosu market would be more motivated to get Mm -hmm. the best of the best. So it's kind of like inspiring um, positive relationship as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. They sustain each other. So it's a it's a mutually beneficial relationship, absolutely. Right. So um, now I like uh, to talk about Takaki Sugita of mm. Nihonbashi Kagura Jo mm. Sugita, which mm. changed your life to, in terms of writing your mm. book that yes. we discussed earlier. Yes. So I he in your book um, there's a quote which I like. Uh, mm. Sushi cuts out anything that is not necessary in and of itself. It's pure and brave. Yeah. So can you elaborate on this? Yes. When he told me this, hmm, I sat for a while and just thought about it. We were all quiet. Um, just considering what those words meant because they were striking words, kind of disarming words. Um, they point back again to the... How do you say the beauty in the simple that Mm. it's an acknowledgement of honesty and it's an acknowledgement of the essence of things and the inherent beauty in the essence of things. Mm. It's much, it requires more, much more bravery to prepare something, which as I said before, very few ingredients. And compared to something which has a lot, as far as I'm concerned, and I think some other people will agree with me, um, that's not to diminish other cuisines in any way. I'm just saying that, for example, if you're going to prepare an iwashi nigiri, and iwashi is sardine, it's a humble little fish, right? There's nothing fancy about it. But if you are preparing it, You've prepared it many times before. You've come to a very high degree of knowledge about this fish, how it behaves when you cut it, what it looks like, what it feels like, how it smells, how it tastes. You are making a statement about the essence of the sardine. And what does that sardine represent in, in as a nigiri? What does it say about your skill, the fish itself, and your identity, it comes back to those same themes, you know, repeated over and over. So even the way, for example, Sugita-san would prepare that particular nigiri, someone else will prepare it differently. So there are different characteristics that come through, and each of the shokunin expresses his style, you know, in a very individual way. Right. Um, but to me, sushi is pure. It's, it's, it's essentially... Um, in many ways, straightforward. Um, it, it has this gorgeous simplicity um, and this honesty about it, which is in- incredibly humbling and d- disarming is the perfect word because disarming to me also conveys that it touches a nerve, it touches a chord that in someone like me makes me very emotional because it, in something in its simplest form is stunning. I mean, I I just keep going back to that. You're not pretending it's something else. You're showing it in its simplicity, its beauty, its inherent 
fishness. I mean, I know that sounds funny, but you're celebrating things. And that takes a degree of confidence, belief, and bravery to put that forward and say, this is the squid, this is the sardine. Um, and to live your life, to say, you know, I'm a, I'm a sushi shokunin, this is what I do. I'm going to clean, you know, the restaurant every night. I'm going to prepare everything with honor for my guests who I honor. It's, it's all of that sense of benevolence, that sense of aspiration and, and just creating things in a way mm -hmm. that touch people, but also at the same time is showing them who you are as a shokunin. I hope that right. makes sense. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, yeah, I totally agree. And then, you know, in the introduction, you use the word gratitude, right? Mm -hmm. So this, um, I think this the sushi chef's mind really always have that word gratitude in mind. Yes. Yes. I, yes. Lost. Absolutely. And also with Sugita-san, he operates a lot according to Bushido. Uh, the way of the warrior there it's a series of virtues such as you know honor benevolence politeness um, honesty and so he lives by this code and so if we remember that for him to say that sushi in and, in and of itself is pure and brave that's very true because he is considering sushi on a plane which is perhaps different than, you know, the person on the street. He considers it uh, to be something filled with virtue. Um, mm. As I said before, honor, honesty, politeness. And he talked to me quite a bit about being balanced, being even, um, to be constant, like someone constant in, in a storm his mentality and his personality, his characteristics allow him to be such an incredible shokunin and he's literally the top. Um, mm. And it's, again, not just his skill, which is remarkable. It's his way of looking at what he does and right. that aspirational mindset that I keep mm. referring to. Yeah. Right. Okay. And uh, the other thing uh, I found interesting, always in your book too, uh, the successful sushi masters often have mm -hmm. their wife mm -hmm. to be the greatest business partner, as they mm -hmm. call Dokami. Mm -hmm. and Dokami, yes. So, right, and that's the case with uh, Katsu Nakaji of Hatsune. Yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. Maybe even more so than some. Um, and of course, there are many shokunin who do not work with their wives. We have to say that as well. Um, but in Nakaji's case, and he is the owner of Hatsune, the third generation, if I recall, um, his wife, Mieko, is extremely important to him in his life in every way. And he would not uh, continue uh, as he does, you know, in the restaurant um, without her. Uh, every decision is made with her. She is there uh, every evening in kimono, um, overseeing things, welcoming guests. Um, and many wives do have this role. Um, and what I do talk about in the Nakaji's case is um, something they were extremely open about is that um, she is suffering from a terminal illness. Uh, so their outlook and the way they have chosen to stay open and welcome their guests is colored by this issue. Um, but they are really radiant. They have a mentality which is extremely open and generous and striving to experience all that is wondrous and beautiful about life in a level that is beyond most people's sort of comprehension on a daily basis. I mean, when you're confronted with this problem, everything mm. changes. Right. And so I talk about that in their chapter. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, by the way, the book is full of great essays and it's a storybook 
very inspirational. Mm. So, yeah, I really recommend listeners. <laughs> you should yes. really take a look. Yes, I right. love telling stories. Right. Um, so what do you think it, uh, re- uh, the readers can learn from the sushi masters, from the sushi masters in the book? Well, so much. I mean, many of the things we're talking about are life lessons, aren't they? Mm-hmm. Um, that transcend any culture. I think that the shokunin's perseverance, uh, devotion to craft that is central to one's life, that sense of purpose, um, I think also sense of pride and their sense of responsibility towards, towards others, uh, towards the past predecessors and future shokunin, their commitment to doing one's best, um, also, their reference to to nature, to product that comes from nature, um, and I think in learning about these shokunin, you're absolutely going to learn about Japan, and that's also the point. Um, you'll gain a lot of insight into um, art, design, you know, aesthetics, philosophies, and even Shinto beliefs, um, or and Buddhist beliefs. You will learn. An incredible amount, uh, many layers, I think, are, are in this book. Um, mm. And because these people touched me so much, I, I just wanted to convey uh, what they taught me. So I think right. there's a tremendous amount you can learn. Mm, right. I completely agree. Mm. Um, so the, um, so, you know, the I think in Tokyo New Wave, you featured a female sushi chef, I did, sushi yes. master, right? Yes. Uh, Homiya Takeuchi. Mm-hmm. And how do you feel about, you know, the, the sushi industry has been known for male dominant yes. for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. So mm-hmm. is, do you think, uh, you know, the sense of like a chef's dress really like in a modern way and having a really like interesting modern lifestyle outside mm-hmm. the kitchens, but mm-hmm. is the, you know, the culture changing? I think the culture is changing. I mean, I think there are two parts to your question. I'll, I'll talk about the female aspect first. Um, I think that this is definitely changing, um, perhaps slowly in, for outsiders looking in, but pretty quickly within the industry, I would say. There are more apprentices now that are female um, there are some of these top sushi ya and sushi shokunin who have taken on female apprentices, which never would have happened uh, 20 years ago, let alone even 10 years ago. Um, it's becoming more common. Many of the shokunin in this book are quite open minded and they are uh, actively training uh, women uh, who will then go on to open their own uh, sushi ya, sushi restaurants, and um, eventually attain this level where these shokunin are. Um, mm. So it's definitely going to happen. It's on the horizon. Right. Um, so do you think they are hiring women because they prove to be competent? Regardless absolutely, of they're competent. And, and I think that many of these shokunin reject some of the historic reasons for why women weren't allowed into sushi restaurants, let alone in the kitchens or behind the counters from body temperature to makeup to um, temperament to problems with hormones. You know, there were all kinds of reasons why women (laughs) were not allowed. Um, So some of the shokunin now do reject that and think that it's, it's not, it's baseless in the sense that if someone has a desire to, to learn and, and loves the sushi world and wants to learn all the aspects that there are to learn about, which take, I mean, it takes forever. I mean, many, many, many years to become a shokunin. Then why not allow that person to do so, regardless of sex? Mm. Um, so I have heard this. Um, there are, however, still many who do not approve of the idea. Um, some of whom are in the book. Uh, so it's it's a mixture um, of those who are definitely uh, approving of the idea and don't see a problem with it at all, and others who still do. So it's it's a it's something that's in flux, but it's it's on the horizon. I keep mm. going. It is happening. Wow, and as, and as far as the uh, modernity of dress or what have you, um, yes, in their private lives, they are, you know, people living in 2000, 
2020, where are we? What year is this? The winter. <laughs> um, I'm hoping, yeah, I can't wait for this year to be over uh, for many reasons, like many of us do. Um, right. But uh, sure, they're in their private lives, just as as modern as can can be. Um, whereas when they are in their restaurants, they definitely have a much more traditional role uh, that they that they play de definitely a much more traditional stance um, and and behavior um, but I think that they they have a, a very good balance um, because whenever they are functioning in their private lives they're still shokunin um, and they're very much aware of that and they would never um, want to change how they are regarded by the community mm. uh so i think they balance it very well right and uh well the sushi has become extremely popular globally and yes. it's now one of the favorite foods for many americans for instance mm -hmm. so how are the 20 sushi masters feeling about the future of sushi as a global food i think they're mostly very positive i think some have concerns about sustainability I think some are concerned about um, the reduction of fish. Obviously, there are problems with man-made disasters. Of course, um, climate change is a, is a concern, absolutely. Um, so I think if you look at it from that perspective, I think there's a definite degree of concern. Um, and depending on where they are, they may be more or less concerned about it. Um, but as sushi in and of itself as an art form or as, as something that characterizes Japan abroad, they're, they're very proud of it. They're not concerned about it. They think it's great that uh, sushi is made all over the world and that some, you know, other types of sushi, um, if they're shokunin abroad, prepare things in a different way, in a way that they might not. They, they appreciate that. They're, mm -hmm. they're open to that interpretation, I believe. Um, right. And so it's, it's all good, but there's definitely the concern about climate change. Mm, right. So, um, so you've now written two great books, and you have close examination of both modern and traditional canary profession, professionals mm -hmm. in Japan. So how do you, what did you learn from the experience and any different views to Japanese culture in your mind? Um, let's see. I absolutely think that there are quite a few differences um, between the chefs that are maybe French influenced or Italian influenced or um, some of the chefs I included in Tokyo New Wave as opposed to the shokunin. Um, but in both, I learned a lot about the chefs in Tokyo New Wave, their humanity, and also the shokunin. And in doing so, um, learned more absolutely about how Japan ticks. Um, and being, you know, living in Japan uh, and having these in-depth experiences with uh, people who are authorities about the culinary world and about cooking, um, they've given me the opportunity to learn, you know, more about farming or a particular flower or a particular uh, food or region. I mean, when I first arrived in Tokyo to live in, in 2015, so many chefs, uh, when I would ask them where something came from, would say Hokkaido. So then I thought, gosh, I've got to go to Hokkaido. I've got to check it out, see what it's like. So many products come from there. Um, so having these interactions is just a constant learning experience in small and larger ways. Um, and uh, I hope to be able to do it again in some other form. Mm -hmm. So you're planning to write another book? Like um, <laughs> and eventually there will be another book exactly uh, about what yet. I'm not sure. Um, but uh, there are so many things to choose from, <laughs> but I'll let I'll keep you posted. I, okay. I don't know as of yet. Yes, right. <laughs> so yeah, I'm looking forward to having you again on the show discussing you. your new book. So, where, <laughs> where can we buy your book? Well, the best place is on my publisher's website, which is aseline.com 
or eu.oslane.com, depending where you are. But for people in the United States, it would just be oslane.com, which is A S S O U L I N E.com. Um, and you can find me mostly on uh, Instagram. Uh, my handle is Tokyo underscore Andrea underscore Fazari. So if you um, put my name in, it will, it will definitely come up. And there I post, um, you know, a lot about Japan and recently, of course, about this book, which was a huge project. So I am delighted and over the moon to share um, anything I can about it. And um, yeah, so Asaline.com is the best. <laughs> Okay, great. So, uh, so listeners, this is really a great book. So again, the title is Sushi Shokunin, Japan's Culinary Masters. Shokunin is S-H-O-K-U-N-I-N, Sushi Shokunin, Japan's Culinary Masters. So thank you so much, Andrea. And uh, well, give me both it. Well, thank you so much, Akiko. Always a huge pleasure. Thank you. All right, listeners, if you have any questions or comments about the show or suggestions for show topics or guests, please contact us at japanneeds at theheritagevideonetwork.org or at kikwatema.com. Japan Needs is a weekly program always available at heritagevideonetwork.org as well as on iTunes, Stitcher, and Spotify as a podcast. I engineer it's uh, Jess Crunchich, and thank you for listening. I'll see you next week. Japan Needs is powered by Simplecast. Thank you for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For freshest content, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Instagram and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. You can also find us at facebook.com slash heritage radio network. Heritage Radio Network is a non-profit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Subscribe to the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join the HRN family by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thank you for listening. Hey, it's Francis Lamb, host of The Splendid Table. Every week on our show, we talk about food and cooking and the meanings of food and cooking. We talk with the most interesting people in food about their techniques, their culture, and everything in between. Whether it's about how fried chicken took over the world or how Instagram changes the way people are actually eating. It's a food show where everyone is welcome. Come join us. You can listen to The Splendid Table wherever you get your podcasts.